I just wrote a few little points that uh, might get you warmed up a little bit for the meta retreat. And uh, just to thank the coordinators first for the lovely welcome. It was almost a representation of what loving kindness really means, that inclusivity. You know, all beings are welcome just as they are. And that's so important, not just bodily, but also mentally, that we're welcome to show up however we feel. And I think it's really important to emphasize that in a metta retreat, because metta is aimed at cultivating a certain kind of mental state or a certain kind of emotional um, feeling and experience in the body and the mind. So it's important not to strive for that, but just to remember that that is accomplished by kindness, kindness to everything that arises. So we're not trying to force anything or make anything happen a certain way. Metta's inclusive of each other and of every aspect of ourself as well. So metta meditation is really the heart of the path. And it's a vitally important aspect of um, awakening as a path towards that awakening and an expression of it as well. And I mean, just imagine a life without kindness, how that would be. I don't think you'd survive very long, you know. Babies have to have that nurture, that kindness from the mother the moment they're born to thrive. And we can see the effects when that's not there. You know, it can it can be with you for the rest of your life. It's just unimaginable how a life with without kindness would be. And also the power of that kindness. It can really transform your day if somebody simply smiles or offers a kind word when you're feeling down, or even just kind of gives you the benefit of the doubt because you weren't in the best of moods, but they didn't hold it against you. And it gives you that sense of freedom and that sense that everything's okay, there is a place for you in this world, there is space, and there's the support of our friends in in human life, not only our human friends, but animal friends as well. So that loving kindness is a very beautiful part of the path, and... uh, I'll explain tomorrow in more detail about how it goes hand in hand with every factor of the Eightfold Path. Because sometimes people ask, where is it? Isn't it, you know, specifically mentioned? And the Buddha did mention it uh, specifically, but also it kind of runs through everything. So the Eightfold Path's like a hologram, each factor reinforcing the other, strengthening it, and developing it as well. Um, And there are many related qualities of loving-kindness. So loving-kindness has this aspect of forgiveness to it, which all the great religions uh, speak highly of. You know, a heart that's resentful and brittle and holding on to grudges really can't be present to what's happening and present to the people in front of us. So we just weigh ourselves down when we can't forgive. You know, loving-kindness has this beautiful aspect of harmlessness. So it's innately ethical which contrasts with other kinds of love. There can be many kinds, which I also want to go into tomorrow. But loving kindness is something that benefits oneself and others. It wishes for all sickness, all uh, distress, all pain to be eased and relieved. So loving kindness has this beautiful benevolence and uh, friendliness and ethical quality, virtuous quality about it. And it's interesting to read about some of the benefits that have been discovered through modern scientific research and uh, studies that have been done in universities like Stanford, which is very famous, uh, I think worldwide, but especially in the US. And they really mirror what the Buddha said with scientific proof. But one of the things I was reading earlier today was that it, it has been shown to increase compassion, to increase empathy, And that means our ability to stay with another who's feeling distress, to really be with another, um, and to be with them in a way that helps them, resources them, holds them in that space. Um, It even can help to recover from PTSD. So many of us have all kinds of traumas in our lives, and sometimes it takes a long time to recover. But loving kindness has really quick effects. And one thing I thought I'd better mention, because most people are interested in this, is that uh, in, in another study, they showed that even 10 minutes of metta meditation and relaxing with that metta can actually increase anti-aging, uh, whatever, <laughs> properties in the brain. It's probably the telomeres or whatever. So you can actually reduce your 
wrinkles <laughs> and looked young and radiant within 10 minutes of meta. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so if you ever get bored in the day and you have 10 minutes, you know, you can do some beauty treatment just by a few thoughts of loving kindness. <laughs> of course, it relieves things like depression as well, but also physical ailments. It can uh, reduce pain, uh, all kinds of diseases, and I'll tell you how I've used it as well in my, with my own health, uh, with success. You only tell the success stories. <laughs> the others are where you're training, right? <laughs> so in this retreat, what we're trying to do is strengthen this innate quality, this innate capacity that we have to love. We'd be dead without it, so we all have it in us. And sometimes we only see where it's missing, we don't see where it's strong. But we want to cultivate it further, and the Buddha said that he wouldn't ask us to develop wholesome states if it wasn't possible to do so. But because it is possible to develop wholesome states, he encourages us to do that. And uh, when we strengthen the metta that we already have, the loving kindness that we already have, we also purify it from things like greed, hate, and um, particularly things like lust, and of course aversion, which extends to qualities like fear, any of the things that really kind of shut down the heart can be expanded and um, overcome eventually, diminished and overcome as patterns that we, we carry and follow in our lives. So we want to strengthen it, to resource ourselves, to nourish ourselves. I think someone was telling me earlier, it's easy, and I related to this, it's easier to develop it towards others than it is towards ourselves. Or sometimes we have it towards ourselves, but we give so much away that we're left quite drained. So in a retreat like this, we have time to strengthen it and really resource and revitalize ourselves with loving kindness. So it's like a refill and then a spill. <laughs> then it can spill. And uh, as we become more and more um, able, I guess, to resource and nourish ourselves internally, that meta naturally starts to flow and guide our actions of body, speech, and mind. And in uh, the Buddhist suttas, there's lots of beautiful passages where the Buddha says that uh, you should develop loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards your fellows in the holy life, which here means all of us, our fellows on this path, here for a week, with whom we share this beautiful space. So even when you're not practicing you know, by speaking or by doing the tasks that you're asked to do around here. You can put a lot of love into that, but you can continue that in your own private space. And it's especially helpful if you have had a little bit of tension arise. Don't judge yourself, it's normal. And loving kindness sometimes illuminates those places that we're stuck. That's one of its purposes, to show us where we do have those aversive tendencies or even patterns of irritation, agitation. So that will arise, but what you can do is go back to your room or go on a walk, just relax and bring up the other side of that person. Try and see things from their perspective. Try and focus on their qualities. The fact that they're here, the fact that they're trying, they're practicing alongside you. And that takes courage. That really takes a lot of integrity because these things aren't easy to develop. Loving kindness takes commitment, it takes real honesty, self-honesty, you know, about where we're stuck and the things that block us. And most of all, it takes a lot of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So as I'll explain tomorrow in more detail, wisdom is almost like the proximate cause for loving kindness because it's the wisdom that all beings, just like us, desire happiness and recoil from pain. And those words are straight from the suttas. All beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. I just think that's so beautiful. And when we really see that, then what is the consequence? It has to be loving kindness, compassion, gentleness, non-harm. So we, we create suffering for ourselves and others through ignorance. We don't wish to do it. I do really believe that even the most terrible atrocities and violences that you see inflicted on others in the world are inflicted out of ignorance. People really believe that those, through those unskillful uh, behaviours they're going to bring about a better change in the world. And sadly, so much of the time we're very deluded about that. 
So to have that humility and to develop the wisdom is a part of metta, a part of enduring loving kindness. Not the kind of love that kind of arises when somebody pleases you or behaves the way you wish they would, but the kind of love that persists even when someone perhaps lets you down. That's the real kind of uh, refuge and security, uh, protective quality of love. So generally speaking, during this retreat, we're going to look at two different modes of loving kindness. One of them, which we'll be beginning tonight in the guided meditation, is metta as an attitude, or if you like, a lens through which we perceive our experience. It's, um, it's a disposition to life. So we infuse our mindfulness with kindness. And there's a lovely little uh, sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, for those who are interested in the Buddha's words. And it's a little yaka. There's these little beings that are like, I don't know, yakas are kind of, not necessarily evil, but a little bit mischievous maybe. We've probably got a few yakas in this room. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe speaker included. (laughs) Because I was secretly thinking, actually, if there's no hot water, it'd be quite an interesting retreat, you know, to see how people manage with a flannel and appreciate the flow of water that's usually there. Anyway, that's my yakka mind. But this little yakka, (laughs) he comes to the Buddha and he says, it's always good for the mindful one. The mindful one dwells in happiness. Better each day for the mindful one, and they are freed from enmity. And then the Buddha says, hmm, yeah, it's always good for the mindful one. The mindful one dwells in happiness. Better each day for the mindful one, but they are not freed from enmity. And then he says, one who has, what is it? One who dwells by day and night, no, one who by day and night takes delight in harmlessness who has loving kindness for all beings, for them there is enmity with none. And this just shows that we need the metta combined with the mindfulness. It's not enough just to be mindful. It's almost like mindfulness illuminates our experience. But quite often there's a bog in the system. We're looking at our experience, but we're looking through a tinted lens. We're looking through a a dirty lens. We bring all our tendencies, our conditioned patterns to the way we're aware. So sometimes we're meditating, we're trying to be mindful, but we're trying to do it to fix ourselves. We're trying to do it to zap away the pain. (laughs) And there's a slight aversiveness in there. But if we can add instead that loving kindness that gives things space and that looks through this, like in a way, slightly rose-tinted lens, It just adds the warmth and suffuses the body, our experience, with some warmth. Then that undermines any tendency of aversion, which I think many of us have. I would say it's usually the default, especially in societies which are conditioned to sort of push us and make us strive and do better and find our faults and improve them, you know. Mm -hmm. And we bring that to the spiritual path. We come here, probably, partly, we're motivated by wanting to be better people, to improve ourselves. But metta is more embracing. It's more like saying, let's accept ourselves for who we are. Let's have a look objectively and kindly and compassionately at our situation and just see where we cause ourselves to suffer. We don't have to actually change ourselves for ourselves or for anyone else only. The Buddha was only concerned with bringing people out of suffering. There was no value judgment involved. So we add this little bit of metta to the way we're aware and this is going to be beautifully practiced with your duties in the mornings, you know, the way that you stir the food, even the way that you open a door, the way that perhaps you are giving a person space to be quiet or perhaps the way you want to use your speech in a courteous and gentle and maybe moderate way as well. You know, just putting that little bit more care into how you approach a person, how you speak to them. Can my words be healing? Can they be supportive? Can they be kind? Yeah. So this gentleness is a big part of loving kindness and we can infuse that into everything we do. 
And then the next main mode of loving kindness, which we're fortunate to have these conditions to practice in, um, is cultivation. So actually, as I said, strengthening the loving kindness we already have and purifying it as well through mainly through the repetition of certain phrases, but also investing them with meaning, investing them with um, energy, and really listening to the spaces between those phrases to allow the message, to allow the, the actual loving kindness to start to grow. And this is what we can do more on the cushion, but also when you're walking meditation, going on a walk, I even um, was practicing this on a long retreat at the Forest Refuge. Uh, was that earlier this year, I think? And I felt a little bit uh, on edge, a bit self-conscious. It's quite easy to feel so... <laughs> it's ironic, but somehow it's quite easy to feel a little self-conscious in the roads in a predominantly lay centre and you're meant to be an example and all this. And I was really ill and I had to kind of heat up my own food and things that monastics don't normally do. So because I, I could feel that I was just tightening up a little bit, I had this phrase come to mind, and it was, may I care for myself like a loving mother. I put the word loving in there because mothers are often used as examples of loving kindness. We don't always have the good fortune to receive the love we wish we could have done or that, we, uh, that would really help us thrive. There is love, but it's not always pure even for a mother. So I always put that word in, may I care for myself like a loving mother. And it would just be a little phrase that would pop up from time to time in the day. And it's incredible how the body can relax when you take in the meaning and the message of that. So this is something you can do at any time. It's just redirecting thought. Uh, not necessarily from a very negative thought, but just a little bit of tightness and you can see that you're going down a negative track. So these are the two sort of main ways. I suppose that encompasses everything because it, it needs to. Loving kindness has to infiltrate every aspect of our lives. And uh, I just wanted to, lastly, just very shortly, invite you to um, really relax into this space and really feel welcome. I think the coordinators and the helpers here have done beautiful jobs, and all of you actually already, in uh, sharing honestly why you came, who you are, and uh, helping co-create this lovely space. And it is a co-creation. It's like a not entirely blank sheet of paper because there's been so many meditators here before, but we can colour it, we can fill it in with even more beauty and metta and harmony, helpfulness, yeah, all of these things, so that we really get the place kind of glowing with loving kindness and those cats are going to be right at the door <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and to really take your time to settle in there was a lot of talk of bells those who've been following me and Ajahn Brown for a long time will know his uh, quip that he likes no bell silence <laughs> on his retreats no bells because then he says if you really practice that way, you may get the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. Oh, and that's not as bad as it gets. <laughs> you know, that's probably a better joke. But anyway, <laughs> there are bells, and it's great because it encourages you to really make the best use of the space and to uh, see how the offerings can support you. But if you find your body just can't do it, your mind's just screaming at you, then please allow yourself to rest. And especially in the first couple of days, uh, take your time to settle in. And uh, in the sitting as well, you know, really try and see that you can be comfortable in your body, however your body asks you to be, rather than pushing your body around and telling it it must be straight, it must be, you know, in lotus or half lotus. You're also welcome to lie down, Preferably, I guess. How would we do that? Hmm. We'd probably have your feet inside, I think, because if your head's inside and someone <laughs> isn't mindful or kindful, then you could be in trouble. So don't worry about the Buddhist rule of not pointing your feet at the teacher. 
the Buddha isn't really there. He won't mind. He's just a bit of brass. I won't mind because I invited you to do that. So take your time to settle into your body. And uh, yeah, even when you're in silence, there is a full silent day on Wednesday. Um, Try and keep that silence softly. You can always smile. You can always, as I say, open the door for someone. You know, just gently allow them to come around to get their tea. It's so nice when you're in this space because it ends up being like this lovely little dance. People just sort of Mm -hmm. move around each other. And it's a way to practice mindfulness and awareness of the situation. That's called sati and sampajanya. So mindfulness is just the sati aspect, but the Buddha always taught it co-joined with sampajanya, which means awareness of the appropriateness of the situation or the context, if you like. So what is appropriate in this given situation? So being mindful of your water usage doesn't just mean watching how much comes out of the tap. Mm. It means being aware of the purpose of the water and the scarcity or or supply and adjusting accordingly. So try to uh, have that situational awareness so that you know if someone else is behind you and they also want to get the tea or whatever. So we're really giving people this sense of we're looking out for one another. And that increases this sense of fellow feeling. I don't know if there's an ungendered word for that, but anyway, fellow, I guess, means all beings, human feeling, and feeling for the animals as well. So that is probably enough to orient you, I hope, and to get you going in metta so you can... Eat with kindness to your body now, knowing the appropriate amount and uh, recognizing with gratitude all the people that have contributed to the meal. And uh, yes, I hope you have a very lovely evening. We'll see you at eight. And before then, these are the metta suttas. So if you want to pass them around, perhaps, and put one by everyone's seat. I think this is just enough for the retreatants, but I do have three extra copies that the coordinators can share as well. So, 